Today, we really, truly, honestly, are going to be talking about the heat engines. How do I know? Because the first slide is a clicker question. What's the purpose of a heat engine? I thought you had a question, Irving. <laughs> hey. So let's see, Eric, don't have it with you? Okay. Oh, you do have, okay. Then I'll wait for you because, okay. I think everyone that's here has answered. So we had zeros for the first three, then 16, one, and three. Pretty clear answer to convert heat into mechanical energy. And that is indeed the goal. So we draw a schematic for, is there a question on that? We draw a schematic for a heat engine to look like this picture on the left. We're putting in heat. We're putting in heat at a high temperature because we know heat naturally flows from high to low. So we're having heat enter at a high temperature and we call that Q in here. Oftentimes we call it QH for Q hot. And then we're getting out the work W. And unfortunately, the laws of thermodynamics demand that we're going to have to have. I didn't see you, Jeffrey. I think you're not on my attendance. Did you? Were you here the whole time? Did you not say anything when I said people who aren't here? You raise your hand. I didn't see apparently. I'm glad I saw you now instead of the end of the class and say, when did you show up anyway? Okay, we have to have some exhausted heat, which we often call QC for heat at cool temperature. Now, hot and cool are relative terms. Hot is hotter than cool is pretty much the requirement for the hot versus cool. And then we have the work. What is it we're trying to get out of the heat engine? Okay, mechanical energy, that is the work. So this is our output. Which one is our input? Let me change the color on that. Which one is our input? I didn't hear you. Which one of the big squiggly arrows? The, big, the, the bigger squiggly arrow? Yeah. The one with the arrow that's going in that says Q in? Yeah, the big, big squiggly. There's our input. And so the efficiency, we are converting energy here from heat into mechanical work. So the efficiency is what we got out, our output, the work, over what we put in the Q hot. It's not what we put in minus what we put out. It's just over what we put in. The what we put out, that's where we lost efficiency, didn't get 100% efficiency. So the fact that thermodynamics demands that we're going to have to have some wasted heat means that you can never have a 100% efficient heat engine. You can't 100% convert thermal energy into work. You're always going to have some exhausted heat at a lower temperature. Now, this is a picture of a steam engine. Steam engine is really quite simple if you look at the schematic. If you're actually designing one, of course, it's going to get much more difficult much, you know, very quickly. But you have water that you pump up into a boiler, and then you have the heat in. How 
How do you make the heat in? Well, it depends on the type of steam engine you're making. Let's say that it's an old locomotive steam engine. They might have been burning wood or burning coal. And so you have a fire under there that's burning, and then you have heat going from the fire into the water. That's your heat in. And of course, when you heat the water, instead of the temperature going up above 100 degrees Celsius, what happens? It gets converted to steam. It undergoes a phase transition. But that steam takes a, a much bigger volume than the water did. And so the pressure above the boiling water is going to go up if you don't allow it to leak. So that pump down there at the bottom, it has to maintain the pressure there that the steam is producing. Otherwise, the water is just going to flow backward. So that pump is keeping the pressure down here. Basically, atmospheric pressure. And pumping the water up, you produce that steam, and then you allow that steam to go into a piston. Now, if that steam goes into the piston, you have a higher pressure than the atmospheric pressure outside. And so that blue arrow is indicating the pressure, the force caused by the pressure difference between air pressure outside and the high pressure inside. How would we relate, relate pressure to the force? Okay, pressure is force over area, which means, you know, I just realized I don't even have a blue pin here, which means that the force is equal to pressure times area. So we have a force of pressure times area. That's the net force if we use the gauge pressure. And then that piston moves because we have this force. Well, if we have motion caused by a force parallel to the force, what do we call that? A force and something moving parallel to the force is work. So that's doing work. And so the work that's done is equal to the force times the distance parallel. Well, the force and the distance that piston moves is going to be parallel. They are going to be parallel. So it's just going to be pressure times area times delta x. Delta x being how far it moves, area being the area of the piston head. But for our nice cylinder, what is area times delta x? Units wise, what is area times delta x units? Area would be meter squared. Distance would be, so meter squared times meters is meters cubed. That's units of volume. And in fact, it turns out while this is not a derivation, it is always true that the thermodynamic work is equal to the pressure times the change in volume. If the volume increases, then your thermodynamic system was expanding into something and doing work on that thing. If it was doing work on that thing, that means energy left. So work is pressure delta V. If delta V is positive, that's work done by the system. If delta V is negative, that's work done on the system. Hence our definition that we usually use of W is work done by the system, because then we just use work as P delta V, and that is work done by the system. <clears throat> so in this steam engine, the piston moves because of the high pressure steam. You close this valve while it's expanding. As it expands, we know PV equals NRT. If V expands, PV equals NRT, then what's going to happen to everything else? If the V expands, we either are going to have the pressure go down or we'd have to have the um, PV. So if you can figure that somehow my brain is interpreting this wrong, because what happens is it cools. V is expanding. It, it, it does cool. I'm not sure where my brain is doing this backward, but my brain is coming up with something different. But I know the answer is when things expand, they cool. 
And so you have the steam cools, drops out the water again, condenses back, and then you pump that water. And so you have a cycle with the water. Now I mentioned for an old steam engine, you would be burning coal or wood. What if you have a nuclear power plant? How does a nuclear power plant work? Anybody, does anybody know? If you don't know, it's not useful to ask the question. Does anyone know how a nuclear power plant works? Alex does. Uh, well, I hope. Uh, he hopes. Doesn't it use the heat radiation from uh, nuclear materials like uranium to uh, heat up water for a boiler? Yeah. When you have a radioactive material, what it means by radioactive is that the nucleus is in an excited state. It's in a higher energy state. And it drops to a lower energy state, releasing energy in some form from the change in the nucleus energy. That form could be electromagnetic waves, what we call radiation right now, or it could be in particles like neutrons or protons or electrons. In any case, there's energy in these particles, and that's why we worry about safety with nuclear radiation, the energy that's being released. We absorb that energy if you've got things to our bodies. Well, in the nuclear power plant, you absorb that energy into water, making the water hot. And then you run other water that didn't absorb the radiation through that, use a heat exchanger to heat up water secondarily. And that water that you heat up from the energy released in the radioactive material is then used in a steam power plant. So the steam engine is used, whether it's nuclear power or if it's gas power or coal power, when you're producing electricity, it's almost always a steam power generator. Whoops, that was too much. So here is going through an actual cycle of a heat engine describing how the work is, you know, force times distance, which turns out is pressure times change in volume. And this picture shows a pressure volume diagram of what's going on with our heat engine. So what we have here is a cycle going through pressure and volume changes for a specific steam engine. So you have that this is, it has an, a chamber here for the piston. It has a valve here that moves back and forth so that you either fill in with high pressure or you exhaust the gas out to make it run. And you have, let's see, let's start at the beginning part. Let's say you have the piston all the way in and then you increase the pressure by allowing hot air in. So that's what's going on right here. The piston is all the way pushed back and then you allow hot air in. That hot air expands. Those are both expansions. <laughs> the difference between those is the valve closes at that point. The hot air expands and pushes the piston. That's when work is being done. And then you get down to this, at this point, the valve is shifted to allow gas to leave. And so that's when you have the exhaust at cooler temperature. You have a flywheel that pushes it back. So this here is something pushing it back and you start over. Now, how do we calculate the output by looking at a diagram like this? We can calculate how much work was done by looking at that diagram. And here's how. We know that work is pressure times change in volume. If we look at a graph of pressure versus volume, in the easy case of a constant pressure, if I do pressure, that's the height here, times the change in volume, that's this, Pressure times change in volume is the area under that line. Even if I have a changing pressure, if I have a change that goes like this, I can break it up into a whole bunch of tiny pieces. And if you take calculus, this is how you start to learn to do an integral. You break it up into a whole bunch of tiny pieces. And you say, okay, each one of those pieces represents the average pressure for a very small change in pressure times the change in volume average pressure times change in volume, add all of those up, 
and it gives you the total of pressure times change in volume as the pressure was changing. And so even with that green changing pressure line, the work is still pressure times change in volume equals area under the line. And remember, it's positive if it's expanding. So that means if the line is moving to the right, then that's positive work. If it was moving to the left, it would be negative work. So if we look back at this diagram, it's positive. Okay, I need a different color. It's positive work following that. So I take all of the area under that, and then I have negative work when it's coming back. Well, if I take the positive work that's under the magenta line, subtract the negative work that's under the blue line, then I get the network is just what's enclosed. So the work is equal to the area enclosed. What direction would the cycle be for negative work done? Clockwise or counterclockwise? Okay, counterclockwise is negative work. And clockwise is positive work. So if you look at a cycle, you can determine if it's doing work, positive work, or having work done on it by looking at, is it clockwise or counterclockwise? And you can determine how much work was done by calculating the area enclosed. Oh, look, pictures to describe what I've just talked about. So if we had an engine cycle that was a rectangular cycle, constant pressure expansion, then if it's constant pressure, we have a name for that. Let me get those names. Constant pressure. Constant ISO. Pressure bar. So an isobaric or isobaric, I can never de decide how to pronounce it, process is a process with constant pressure. So if I look at this diagram, going from A to B is constant pressure. Going from D to C is constant pressure. Those are isobaric. Then I have constant volume. What word means constant? Iso. Volume, you're not going to guess. Isochoric is constant volume. You will also see the word isovolumetric. Obviously easier to remember. But you need to know both words, so I only use the one that you're not going to remember easily, isochoric, to help you in the memory process. So isochoric means constant volume. Now remember, work had the equation P delta V. So if I have a constant pressure process, an isobaric process, the pressure is constant and work is very simple to calculate. Just the pressure times change in volume, boom, you're done. If I have an isochoric process, what's the work going to be? Easier or hard to calculate? It's going to be zero, which is the easiest thing to calculate. Why is it zero? Well, if it's isochoric, that means constant volume, constant volume, Clearly, delta V equals zero. So P delta V must equal zero is the work. Notice that work is not the change in parenthesis pressure times volume. It's the pressure times the change in volume. So if you have a constant volume, there is no work. Constant pressure, easy to calculate work. So that's why we start showing a square cycle. Do we make heat engines that do this? Yeah, not really. 
but it's a nice way to start. Now we get a new one, adiabatic. This word here. Adiabatic, I believe it's Latin word, maybe it's Greek. It means no flow. More specifically, no flow of heat. So an adiabatic process is a process where heat is zero. Now remember, delta U is equal to Q minus W. So for an adiabatic process, Q is zero. What does that tell you about the temperature? Okay, we tend to think it means no change, but that's wrong. It's because we start thinking once again that heat is temperature, but heat and temperature are not the same thing. If I put energy in, what's going to happen to the temperature? It's going to rise because if I put energy in, the average temperature per energy per molecule rises, and that's what temperature is measuring. So even if I have no heat, I can have the temperature change. In fact, if I have a monatomic ideal gas, we know that delta U is equal to 3 halves NR delta T if it's a monatomic ideal gas. And so that would be equal to minus the work if it is adiabatic. I better put adiabatic here or somebody's going to say, wait a minute. Because that's only true if it's an adiabatic process. So the work is minus 3 halves nr delta t. So if the work done by the system is positive, the temperature is going to go down. It makes sense because if the work is done by the system, energy went down, less temperature went down. So adiabatic does not mean constant temperature. Isothermal, iso means the same. Thermal is temperature. And so isothermal means the temperature is constant. If the temperature is constant, if it's a monatomic ideal gas, delta U being 3 halves nRT is also zero. It's constant internal energy if it's an isothermal process. So isothermal process, the energy doesn't change. Your heat is equal to, well, the heat added is equal to the work done by the system to make the first law true. And so you have different calculations for what the actual work is depending on which process it is. Now, this here is very convoluted looking. The work for an adiabatic process, let's not worry about that right now. The work for isothermal process, likewise, we won't worry about that right now. Those are equations in the calculus class next Tuesday. We'll go ahead and derive where these come from. I'm not going to put these two equations on the exam. So we'll come back and worry about them after the exam. Something that is important to note is that an isothermal process on a PV diagram is not the same as an adiabatic process. And to find the work, you have to use one of these equations because it's kind of hard doing the area under it. So for now, we will move on and make sure we understood what those terms are. What is a process where no heat transfer occurs called? Now, I'm going to warn you, I'm going to call on four people when we're done to have them, each one will describe one of these words, just so you know what you're going to be called on to do here. Missing Michaela and Brittany. Getting there, Brittany? Well, I mean, your grade is affected, so I don't want to go.
Okay, so we had three zero zero seventeen, and let's start with Christian. What does isothermal mean? When the temperature doesn't change. Right, isothermal, no change in temperature. I'll just go this one. Lauren, what does isochoric mean? Okay, we're doing well with these terms. <laughs> Not having luck with these cards. Amanda, what does isobaric or isobaric mean? Um, what was the first word that goes before that? Oh, no. no change in pressure, right. And last... But not least, Brittany, what does adiabatic mean? No heat transfer. Okay, it's important that we know those terms, so that's why I had each person answer one of them. And so the correct answer, as specified by Brittany, is adiabatic means no heat transfer. Remember, there was a reason I talked about the isothermal and the adiabatic Make sure we understand that thermal is temperature, not heat. And so they're not the same thing. Okay. Here is one statement, the one we already know for the second law of thermodynamics. Heat always flows spontaneous from hot to cold. Nothing new for us to learn there except for a simple rule about the heat engine. Notice this heat engine looks just the same as what we did before, except for now it shows a hot or a heat reservoir at a high temperature and a low temperature. Reservoir means you can add a lot or take a lot away and the temperature isn't going to change. So that's what those represent. It has a mathematical equation relating what energy flows in must flow out. There is a presupposition that goes with that. That's only going to be true if the change in internal energy for the heat engine is zero. Now, we have to think about that to justify it, not just say, oh, here's a new rule. The change in internal energy of the heat engine must be zero. Let me give you a counterexample to show why that's not always true. If I were to go out to the engine of my car right now and just grab that exhaust manifold, what would happen? Keep in mind, I came here at 830. It would, and now it's been two and a half hours since I drove it. It's cooled down to air temperature. It would be a little chilly. So if I put my hand on that right now, it's a little chilly. Now I start up the engine. The engine of my car is a heat engine. If I let my car run for five minutes, I grab that exhaust manifold, what's going to happen? It's going to burn me. Something serious. That means that the internal energy of that manifold, part of the engine, did not stay constant. It went up. But once I have my car running for five minutes, what's going to happen to the engine temperature over time? Assuming my car is running fine. It'll stabilize and stay at one temperature. For the engine to continue operating properly, we can't have the temperature continually rise. Otherwise, it would eventually melt. Conversely, we can't have the temperature of the engine continually drop, or eventually it would reach absolute zero and we'd be violating laws of physics. So for the engine to continue to operate, you have to reach the state where there is no change in internal energy. So once you've reached equilibrium for the engine operating, you have delta U equals zero for a complete cycle. And then we can use that simple statement to say energy in has to equal energy out. So the QH is the only thing that's coming in. QC and W are coming out. So we have QH is equal to W plus QC. Just solve that for work, and you have work is equal to QH minus QC. So that's a simple rule for the heat engine. 
you're not going to have that equation on your equation sheet. That's the kind of thing that comes from your knowledge. You're not going to have that equation. You certainly should be able to justify it. Etika. So then we can use that equation? Like, let's just say we want to use it. And, but it's if like you want to use it, you should say, you know, change the energy is zero for a complete cycle of the heat engine. So W equals QH minus QC. Oh, okay. Right? It, you have to have some justification. You can't just pull it out of thin air. Talking briefly about the car engine because I just used it. I go over this to help us understand the practicalities of these heat engines. Most of us drive a car with an internal combustion engine. Does anyone have a car that does not have an internal combustion engine? Okay, we have one student that has, I assume it's an electric car rather than a pedal car. The same, same. Okay, when I start the question, does anyone have a car <laughs> That is not internal combustion engine. I did not expect people to answer yes. My non-existent car. <laughs> yes, but that, that's fine. Okay, so the internal combustion engine. My automobile has a four-cycle engine. On the other hand, my snowblower, or because I get in a hurry when I write things on the gas for the snowblower, says snob blower. My snowblower is a two-stroke engine. What's the difference in a two-stroke and a four-stroke engine? <laughs> yeah, yes, the astute person says the number of strokes, one has half as many as the other. Well, let's go over the four-stroke engine there. Very briefly, we'll talk about the two-stroke engine. So the four-stroke engine, I don't know about you guys, but in high school, yeah, I took auto mechanics, and we had to learn, you know, these intake compression power exhaust strokes. And now we're going to talk about these in terms of what's going on with physics. So for your internal combustion engine, the, the important part of the engine is the cylinder. The cylinder is shown here. These are the cylinder walls. Inside of that cylinder, you have the piston, the thing that slides up and down. You have two valves at the top. One is for intake and one is for exhaust. So this is going to be the intake on this side. Wow, that's, that's the word intake, believe me. And this side is exhaust. And then we have a tie rod. If you've ever heard of somebody throwing a rod, this here is the tie rod or rod for short that connects the piston to the crankshaft. So when they talk about your crank, there's your crankshaft. The crankshaft, as you can see, it has its axis of rotation is that red dot. And then it has offset where the tie rod connects. So as the tie rod comes down, it's going to push this in a circular fashion. And then you have angular momentum that you build up. They actually put flywheels in cars, flywheels, just heavy wheels, so they have a moment of inertia. You make them spin, and they're going to have angular momentum or rotational kinetic energy. And after it finishes pushing down, that angular momentum is going to keep going, and you're going to convert some of that rotational kinetic energy into pushing the piston back up. So that's the physical construction. So let's talk about the intake. During the intake cycle, here's our cylinder and the piston is moving down. The piston is moving down, actually being pulled down by the crankshaft. And up in the top, you have the intake side open. So as the piston goes down, the volume increases, the pressure drops, you have a higher pressure on the intake side, and you're going to have gas and air flow in. You have your fuel gas mixture. Now, if you have a car that has 
um, fuel injectors, the fuel is injected separately from the air. If you have an old carbureted engine, it actually mixes the fuel in the air in the carburetor. That's the carburetor's purpose, to mix the fuel in the air to get the right ratio of oxidizer and fuel that then comes in. You had a question, Patty? So these are all connected together in a way that like one goes out and goes to the other, or are they connected well, together? The physical connections are shown here. And so the working of the um, valves, you have a little camshaft that's in the head. The head is the stuff that's on the top of the pistons. And you have that camshaft, and then you have a timing belt that connects that camshaft to the crankshaft so that they move in sequence with the crankshaft. So like, then these are not like can I, I mean like are like let's just say like four of those <laughs> together. Those are four pictures of the same. Oh, the same different, different times. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, this is an automatic class. I don't want to go into all the details, but I want oh, people I just, to understand. I was wondering, like, if, like, the energy like passes through one and that's how. Um. Well. Yeah. In the end, if you have a four-cylinder engine, they make them so they're firing at different times, so you have a smoother run. But it would still run if they all hit at the same time. It would just be a really rough run. You go, boom, boom. <laughs> we wouldn't like that so much. Okay. So during the intake, the piston is going down and you have air and gas that come in. Then for the power, or excuse me, for the compression stroke, here's our cylinder. Now we close up all of our valves and we have the crankshaft pushing the piston up. So the volume is decreasing. What's gonna to happen to the pressure temperature? Okay, the, the temperature of the gas is gonna get hotter, the pressure is gonna increase. The engine is running quick enough that there's not much heat flowing in and out during these processes. So the internal energy increases, the temperature has to increase. And so it compresses so you have a hot, higher pressure. Then a miracle happens. There is something in here that's not shown in our diagram. Well, it shows it as two. In the piston, you have a spark plug. And the spark plug, it's made out of a ceramic because the ceramics are good electrical insulators. You put a high voltage on the center of the spark plug. I don't know about you guys, but when I was a kid, like with the lawnmower, it was the joke, somebody who's a newbie, I came from Africa, I didn't know anything. They're like, hey, touch this on the lawnmower. You're okay, I touch it. Got the bejesus shocked out of me. Because you put a high voltage on that end of the spark plug, the engine of your car is connected to the ground. We'll learn about all this ground stuff next semester. But that causes an arc to pass between the metal that goes through this ceramic. Oh, I want the fatter pin causes an arc to go between that black there, the metal goes through the ceramic, and the little pin at the end that's connected to the chassis, which is grounded. So I have hot, high pressure gas, and I put a little spark in there, what happens? It blows up, that's exactly right. The song I like to, you know, it only takes a spark to get a fire. Yeah, so it catches on fire. It blows up, you have a very rapid release of thermal energy because of the chemical reaction that's going on as you oxidize the fuel. And so you suddenly have a rapid release of energy that's heat flowing in. So this is where you have the major QH occurs when the spark happens. Well, once you have that, then you have a really, really high pressure and that really, really high pressure is where you get your power stroke. So this is still closed off and you have the very high pressure pushing this down 
And so that's power. And then the final stroke is it comes back up. I'm not even going to draw the final one. It comes back up and you open up the exhaust valve and you just push out all of that gas. Now here's some interesting things. When you put gas in your car, do you ever pay attention to what kind of gas you're putting in? Let's start with obvious things. What color should the nozzle be? Did somebody say green? If you have a diesel, it should be green. If you don't have a diesel, a diesel, don't use the green one. A relative had an RV. Use the green one. They don't have, well, the engine was destroyed within five miles because they put in the wrong fuel. Okay, so that's a, a starter. So you put in the gasoline, and you have that octane number. What does the octane number tell you? <coughs> you know, I used to think it meant, okay, so you know I was wrong. I used to think that the octane number told you how much energy it contained. So if I put in like 94 octane, that's a whole lot more energy than 87 octane. Not what it means. The octane is telling you about the ratio of long chains to short chains in the, um, the carbon, hydrocarbon um, molecules. Octane obviously is eight carbons in a chain, and the octane number is telling you how many eight or over you have. And it's actually not exactly measuring that anymore. But the octane tells you about how quickly the gas is going to burn. The higher the octane, the slower the gas is going to burn. If it burns slowly, that means you're not going to have as big of a hammer on the pistons. It's going to be a little easier on the pistons. You're going to have a longer time for the pressure to build up because it's burning more slowly. And so your car is built to run with, you know, optimally with different octanes just for, you know, it, it's part of the design and setting the timing and so on. So the octane is important to that burning process. It's odd. Last year, Ken and I were talking about this and we had an opposite understanding of what octane means. I'm pretty sure when I looked it up, I was still right, but Dr. Osborne knows a lot. So it worries me. So this internal combustion engine is a heat engine. It's a rather complex system but it's something that you can now fully understand in terms of how it works. It's a heat engine. You put in heat at high temperature. That is the burning temperature of the gas that causes the pressure to go up, pushes the piston down, doing the work. And then you exhaust the gas at the low temperature, the low, low temperature of, oh, I don't know, 200 degrees Fahrenheit, 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Hey, that's not very low. That will burn you. But that's what the temperature cold is for a car engine. Here is the idealized cycle used in an automobile engine. It's called the auto cycle, not for the same reason as automobile. That's the last name of a dude. Uh, a German scientist came up with the auto cycle, just like the diesel cycle is a German scientist named Diesel. Um, so the auto cycle has... What do you call the process here on a PV diagram going from B to C? It's isochoric because there's no change in volume as the heat is added. So that is, you light that fuel, it burns really quickly with the piston not moving. And so that's why it shows up as an isochoric process there. Then you have an adiabatic expansion. What does adiabatic mean? No heat. So that means Q is equal to zero on this portion. Why is Q zero? It's not because the piston is perfectly insulated. Because it's not. It's because the process occurs so quickly, there's really no time for heat to flow. And then you have another process here. What would you call that process? Name? Not Bob.
I give you a clue. It's ISO something. Isochoric again. What's happening there is you are simply letting the gas out. Um, actually, I say letting the gas out. It is letting the gas out. It's, it's never going to be exactly like this in a car engine because you're letting the gas out. And when you let the gas out, it's, it's going to expand the volume. Um, the piston doesn't expand, but the gas does. And then you have the adiabatic compression. So that's the auto cycle. That's an idealized cycle that's used in the automobile. And we can calculate the efficiency of this engine by calculating the workout divided by the heat that you put in. So you can go through and you can carefully analyze this and calculate its efficiency. And you find its efficiency, best case scenario, might be 30% 30, 30 or so. You're like, whoa, that's not very good. Can we do better? Well, Saudi Carnot came up with the ideal and impossible heat engine. It's ideal because using our thermodynamics, we can calculate this is the most efficient engine you could imagine. The problem is you can only imagine it because you would have to run quasi-statically, which means that it is quasi-statically? Yeah. It's running so slowly that it's always in equilibrium. How do you make that happen? You run it so it takes an infinite amount of time to complete one cycle. That's not a very useful engine if it's going to take an infinite amount of time to complete one cycle. So this is a theoretical engine, but it's the theoretical most efficient engine you can make. With this Carnot engine, you have an isothermal constant temperature heat transfer in. So QH occurs at a high temperature. And then you have an adiabatic expansion and then an isothermal heat flowing out. And then finally an adiabatic compression. So isothermal expansion, adiabatic expansion, isothermal contraction, adiabatic contraction. If you do the math, which we're not doing the math here, but the outcome of the math is important, is something that you need to know for the test. It turns out that for the Carnot engine, the ratio of the heats is just equal to the ratio of the temperatures. Now, what units must I use for temperature here? I must use kelvins. If you try to use this with Celsius, you know, you could have like a negative temperature Celsius and you're like, whoa, so my Q hot is negative, right? No, that, that's not the way it works. You have to use kelvins. And so in this process, in the Carnot engine, since the efficiency is equal to the work divided by QH, but work is equal to QH minus QC. You put those two together and you have the efficiency is equal to QH minus QC over QH, which is 1 minus QC over QH. And if it's Carnot engine, that means it's 1 minus temperature cold over temperature hot. So the efficiency of Carnot engine is simply de defined by the temperatures of the hot and cold reservoirs. Now, what's the use of this Carnot engine? We can use this Carnot engine to calculate what the ideal efficiency is between our hot and cold temperatures. So you have an automobile. You're cooling it with water. Your cold temperature is going to be somewhere close to the boiling temperature of water. You've got to keep it below the boiling temperature of water for obvious reasons. And so your temperature cold might be somewhere around let's say 200 Fahrenheit, or yeah, 200 Fahrenheit, but making a different number, 90 degrees Celsius converted to Kelvins. Your temperature hot is the temperature of the burning gas, and you can calculate what would the ideal efficiency be with these two temperatures. And so you just put in those temperatures and find, ah, um, just for grins, let's say the temperature hot, I don't know what the temperature of the gas is, so I'm just going to say, 500 kelvins is the temperature that's burning hot and the temperature cold is about 360 kelvins so you go and you calculate that oh <clears throat> i put them upside down didn't i 
I put temperature hot on top and temperature cold on bottom. And you see, wow, the Carnot efficiency, the highest efficiency possible is less than 50%. If I have a car engine that's getting anywhere close to that, I feel really, really good about that engine because I'm approaching the ideal efficiency for that engine. So the Carnot engine is really important in that it lets us know if we're doing close to the best we can or not. So you will need to be able to calculate the Carnot efficiency. You'll need to be able to relate the work and energy in an engine. You'll have to know why we have heat engines, what their point is, and we won't talk about the conventional power plant. All right, have a great vacation.